Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us as we continue the 2021 Lectures in Mathematics Education series. Our fifth installment in the series will be led by Dr. Marta Seville and, graduate, and a graduate student of hers, Fanny Salazar, both joining us from Arizona. Uh, the Lectures in Mathematics Education series is sponsored by the Herman and Rache Math Initiative and the University of Southern California's Rossier School of Educa Education with the goal of highlighting important research targeted at improving teacher effectiveness in mathematics education. Uh, we're thankful to be able to provide access to the series virtually and for our guest speakers and everyone joining us uh, in this newfound digital space. And today I'm happy to introduce Dr. Marta Seville and Fanny Salazar, who will be giving a talk titled Learning Mathematics with and from Parents, Implications for School Mathematics. Uh, Marta Seville is a professor of mathematics education and the Roy F. Gracer uh, Chair in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Arizona. Her research looks at cultural, social, and language aspects in the teaching and learning of mathematics, participation in mathematics classrooms, connections between the in-school and out-of-school mathematics, and parental engagement in mathematics. She has led multiple funded projects working with children, parents, teachers, primarily in Mexican-American communities. Her research is grounded on the concept of funds of knowledge with a focus on developing culturally sustaining learning environments in mathematics education. Her most recent work includes K3 parent, parent engagement mathematics project aimed at developing a two-way dialogue between home and school and new collaboration with two other universities focused on the development of mathematical partnerships that engages teachers, parents, and multilingual children in grades three through five in underserved communities. She is also exploring how to apply the lessons learned from her work in equity and K-12 settings to undergraduate and entry-level mathematics teaching and learning at the university level. Joining her, Fanny Salazar is a graduate student in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies at the University of Arizona. She is interested in working and doing research with parents from underserved communities about, her, about their participation and engagement in mathematics education of their children. Also, she is interested in on how parents as adult learners use their experiences to make sense of mathematics. For the past year, she has been doing research with Mexican American parents and teachers. Currently, she is working with Dr. Marta Seville on, their, on her project with teachers, parents, and multilingual children in grades three through five in underserved communities, which just described. Um, after Dr. Seville and Ms. Salazar finish, we'll have time for questions. And when the time comes, we ask that you kind of post those questions in the chat box. And we'll get to as many as we can uh, before the four o'clock bell comes around. Uh, for the talk, you can make sure uh, that you're in speaker view and please mute your microphone during the presentation. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Seville. All right, thank you so much, Michael, for this introduction and for organizing uh, this series. I'm certainly looking forward to presenting and, you know, and Fanny and I have been preparing for this. And I think that Fanny is also excited to present it, but I'll let her <laughs> decide if that's how she feels. And thank you for everybody else who's been involved in organizing this. I think that, you know, I started with my connection with Morgan with the, the brief for newcomers and the whole thing then rolled into this. So I'm looking forward to this. I'm going to share my screen and then we'll go from there. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so, okay. Let's see. And I'm going to start the All right, hopefully you see the regular view. Okay, because <laughs> all right. So we probably over prepare slides. So let me tell you the first part, it's kind of an outline overview of the work that I've done over the years. And I may go a little bit too fast. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, just because I'm concerned that if not, we won't get to talking more about the two activities, which is the classroom visits and the math for parents, and then the general implications. And also we want to report a little bit on a conversation that we had recently with some of the mothers in one of our projects during COVID-19. So just to get their, their impressions, okay? So the first part, as I said, I mean, for a over 25 years, I think that almost like 30 actually, I've been working with working class um, families of Mexican origin and we use different formats. We have workshops, 
So like one-time workshops type things. We have courses for parents only. We also for parents and children. And something that is quite unique of some of the work that we've done is workshops that are given by parents to parents. And these are all math workshops. Okay, so what I'm saying, you know. The key concept behind the work that uh, we've been doing is this idea of parents as intellectual resources. So we value what they know and the experiences they bring. Okay, so that's like a, one of the theoretical concepts that we work uh, from. The other component is the forms of knowledge. And I know that at least some of you are familiar with this. So the term forms of knowledge was actually developed by anthropologists here at the University of Arizona. And this definition is one of many, but is this idea basically that all communities, all houses, every, you know, everyone, they, there is historically accumulated and culturally developed bodies of knowledge and skills essential for household or individual functioning and well-being. So the idea is that all communities with which we work have knowledge, experiences, and resources. The work that I did in the Funds of Knowledge for Teaching Project and that later became Project Bridge because it was more specific to mathematics, while the first one was not, had these four, well, actually had three components and then I added a fourth one. So the components were the, the teacher study groups. So these were teacher researchers getting together and discussing you know, uh, ideas about how to uh, bridge the gap perhaps between the school mathematics or the school, in my case, mathematics, but school learning and out of school. Household ethnographic analysis. So the teachers will go into the homes with very detailed questionnaires and do ethnographic visits. And then teacher study groups, we debrief the household ethnographic and we develop modules that we implemented in the classroom. That was the forms of knowledge. I went ahead and added with a colleague of mine, this idea of parents as intellectual resources. And that's where the workshops with parents came in. Because the idea was that we were going into the homes and learning from the parents, but we were not necessarily giving back to the parents. And some of the parents had expressed interest in, for example, learning mathematics. So then we started developing more this work with them. The home visits, just to give you an idea, basically the, the questionnaires were developed by anthropologists, as I said, and they're very extensive very ethnographic and they range over these different topics that we have here. We added something on mathematics, so mathematical attitudes, and we added a few more questions on mathematics, but generally speaking, those were, you know, family structure, labor history, household activities, mathematical attitudes, and parental attitude, parenting, money, religion, education, ethnic identity. There was um, a very it's not here, but I mean, there was something on language, of course, because we're working mostly with bilingual in bilingual settings. So learning from the families, teachers are often surprised at how welcome they felt into the home and how much they learned. So often we hear, you know, wow, you know, am I going to be able to go into the home? Are they going to want me? Of course, they don't go into every student's home. They're very selective because it's very ethnographic, very, it takes a lot of time. And they're usually very welcome. I mean, everybody reported that. They often report developing a stronger rapport with the students whose house they visited. And the experience has affective and cognitive implications. They build rapport and they are able to develop an instruction that reflects the students and families' forms of knowledge. So here are a couple of teachers' reflections from the work that I started doing more with mathematics. Based on the home visit, I know what the student does in her family and what the family does. It makes me more sensitive to asking questions that I know she knows the answers to. It is great. She's now participating more in class. This is an interesting one. I guess realizing that the home is a real learning place, real learning environment. You know, I didn't think it was so much a learning environment as it is. And so is this idea of seeing the homes of the students and keep in mind that we're talking mostly about students who may are often marginalized um, to see them as resources, to see them as places of learning. Even a light version can be powerful. And by a light, I mean something that I've done in my courses where we don't do the whole ethnographic training, but I give them a little bit, I give them a few questions and I say, you know, just go and have a conversation with the family, go visit the family. And so this is a teacher 
uh, on a paper that she wrote. The final implication of this visit that I would like to share is what it taught me about myself. If nothing else, I have learned that I must really examine my assumptions about people before passing judgment and be honest about how my own reality colors my version of the world. And this was in the context of a teacher who was concerned that her students were not taking um, advantage of the after school programs. And when she went and visited the family, the main reason was that the family wanted to spend quality time after school as a family. And she hadn't thought about that. You know, for her, it was more like, we're providing these wonderful programs. How come the kids are not there? And what was happening is the kids were actually helping and doing things in the home and with the family, but not because they needed necessarily the, the help. It was just more like a family, you know, something doing, doing something together. So we often talk about parental involvement. We prefer the term parental engagement, but quite often in the school, you know, in the policy documents is parental involvement. And so basically here, quoting Guadalupe Valdez, we should uh, you know, take, uh, take into consideration that parental involvement programs need to be based on sound knowledge about the families we work with. Quite often we develop them based on our views of what parents should do instead of reflecting the needs and experiences of the community. So our goal in the work that we do with parents is a more authentic engagement of parents in the mathematics education of their children through a two-way dialogue um, between the school and the home. So what have we learned? So a few things. Parents enjoy doing mathematics and want to learn about the mathematics that children are learning. Parents can be very effective facilitators of workshops for other parents, what I mentioned uh, earlier about the workshops. They connect with them, they share the trepidation, they can bring a more informal way of interacting about mathematics. You know, they can tell them, oh yeah, I was there, or you can do it. Teachers can also do that, researchers can also do that. It just doesn't have the same, you know, message. Parents, like everybody else, may have strong beliefs about what is mathematics and about the proper way to do it. So in the next slide, we're going to, I'm not going to ask you to, uh, <laughs> to share anything, uh, uh, you know, right now. I mean, probably if we were in a face-to-face -face or whatever, but think about how you learn how to divide. You know, just if you have pencil and paper or something, maybe do the division or start doing it or you don't have to, but, and think about um, how you learn how to divide. And I'll give you just, you know, seconds to. And as I said, not how you might divide now, not the fact that you might use a calculator, but how you learn. And I'm going to show you how I learn how to divide. So this is the same division, 1224 divided by 42, but this is how I would set it up and how people in Colombia would set it up and in other countries, okay? This is how they would do it in Mexico and how it's usually, I mean, traditionally uh, done in the US. So you notice that in the US, we, or they, depending, I never know which pronoun to use here because I still divide the way that I just show you, um, we put the subtraction. So we know we, we do the multiplication and we put so minus 84 and then we do it. And but in Mexico, in the Mexi Mexico, it's they put directly the result of having subtracted. The same way that here, we put directly the result. Okay. So basically we do the subtraction in our head. Okay, in all the years that I've been working with parents of Mexican origin, division always comes up. And so let me share with you a quote from a mother. Well, actually the last, the next slide, sorry, before that. This is the method that quite often now we see in the schools. And so you might, you know, I remember being at a workshop where I share my method then we did it the way that is studied in Mexico. Then we did it the way that is studied in the US or used to, or, you know, and then a couple of sixth graders came and, and shared this way, the scaffold method, okay? All right, so let's look at this quote from a mother, Mexican mother. And she says, the education in Mexico is much better than here in the US, much more. The level is better in Mexico, specifically because I came from that country. 
but I imagine that the people in Latin America are going to defend their point of view. But for example, when I looked at how my son was dividing, he subtracted and subtracted, and that he wrote the whole equation, I even said, what teacher wants to make things complicated? No, son, not that way, this way. And he learned faster this procedure, meaning her procedure, the, the Mexican way, for lack of a better term. I said that the first bar barrier is visual. We as parents don't speak English or we don't understand English. Numbers don't need language. But if visually you see such a mess, and by a mess, she means, if you think about, this is not a great example in that I don't think there is regrouping. I don't even pay attention, to be honest. Yes, there is, but, um, but anyway, but when there is regrouping, you know that you cross out and you put, that's the mess that she's referring to. Here, I, I left it very clean, right? So I mean, four, and then you go, um, you know, four to 12, eight, you know, I, I didn't put anything, but you will be, you can imagine the, the crossing out and the regrouping, that's the mess. In Mexico, you wouldn't see the mess because you are doing the subtraction in your head. And furthermore, usually Mexican parents are going to share that they, their method is more efficient and that kids should be able to be doing these things in, in, in their head. Again, this is not a matter of deciding which is better, which is, is more to understand that we all bring values and valorization of knowledge. And that mathematics is not culture free. So think about the richness in looking at these different methods, comparing them, bringing them to the classroom. If you have children whose parents or themselves, you know, may have learned other ways and talking about, about this. So for example, this is a sixth grade teacher celebrating that diversity. The Latino children, if their parents come from Mexico, then they probably did it a different way. If you're looking at algorithms, they're going to be like, my dad does it this way, or my mom does it this way. And so then you are bringing in another way, so they're seeing maybe even a third or a fourth or a fifth way to attack a problem. Okay, so this is a teacher embracing the diversity. Or you have this other teacher who is somewhat dismissing it. We are teaching division and multiplication, and the children are doing it the way we ask. This Wednesday, when we did it, Eliseo said, oh no, my mom did it different. And he went to the board and did it that way. And I said, yes, but that's in mom's home. Let's do it the way that we do it in the school. Now, I have to clarify that the child didn't quite know how the mom was doing it. And so kind of got stuck. But the teacher sort of dismissed it. And this is a learning moment. Maybe the teacher could have invited the mother and say, you know, I noticed that you have a different way of doing. Could you show it to me? So what message do we send when we say this is the school way, this and that is the home way? What we argue is that it should not be about having to learn the school method and rejecting the home method. Children, in particular children of non-dominant backgrounds, should not be asked to have to choose. It goes beyond generational differences, beyond the I didn't learn this way because we are actually looking at whose knowledge is, is valued or not valued. And if we are talking about marginalized communities, that's what we're focusing on. So we need a better communication between the schools and, and families to prevent this quote from a teacher, I mean, sorry, from a mother who had been a teacher in Mexico. Last night, my son said to me that school from Mexico was not valued the same as school here. That is, it doesn't count. What I studied there doesn't count here. He knows that what is taught here is different from what is taught there. And so he says, why would I ask my mom for help if she's not going to know? So there is a barrier. And yes, there was a barrier with the language. I mean, you know, in the sense that the, the mother was not proficient in English and the teaching was in English, but not necessarily a, a barrier with the knowledge, I mean, with the content, sorry. So that's, you know, what we wanted to emphasize here. So the components of this approach is resource-based approach. For example, this teacher that we just um, saw earlier views home knowledge as an asset towards the student's education. The idea of dialogue, parents want to have opportunities to share their ways and ideas about mathematics, teaching and learning, and they want to learn about the school ways. And confianza, which is a key word when they're working with anyone, but in the Mexican community, in the Latinx community, this idea of trust, communication, feeling like a family. And so here is a quote from a mother. She says, we're all equal. If you feel that you are equal to them, the teachers, it's very important for all because we are all a family. We are here the whole day. They have our children the whole day. 
one way or another, we interact with each other. And I think that if we break those barriers, you'll see, I think everything will work better. So we're going to now describe two activities. We're not going to talk about the parents as workshop facilitators, but I kind of mentioned that that's a very strong component. We're going to talk about classroom visits and an example from the math workshops for parents. So let me first give you some background and then uh, Fanny will tell us more about the classroom visits. So how were our teachers and preservatives teach us about what parents think about the teaching and learning of mathematics? These activities, the classroom visits, the um, math for parents, the meetings with the parents and teachers, they allow us to build some bridges between teachers and parents. They can serve as settings to uncover and discuss our beliefs and values that I just shared. So for example, those beliefs and values that the mother had about division in Mexico. Classroom visits, they are a powerful way to engage in dialogue with the parents. They see the teaching through their lenses, their experiences, values. It helps all of us to make the familiar strange as we may question the routines and traditions that we take for granted, right? Because they are observing the class from a different point of view. So they might be saying, oh, how come the teacher did that? And we might have always thought that that was the way that it was supposed to happen. So we're going to see an example now, and now I'm going to turn it over to Fanny. So we have here an example from a classroom visit that the mothers did from the project that we had. Uh, it's a sixth grade mathematics classroom, and the mothers were there for about 30 minutes of the, of the class, and the topic was fraction divisions. Two main teams that, um, are us while we were debriefing the, the classroom visit after we were in the classroom, or where uh, that the mothers really appreciated the way, the way in which the classroom was arranged or how the students were sitting in groups. Um, Alondra, that we have at the quote right here, that she said, because of the way they are seated in the classroom, they can have a conversation about the problem. When we were students, you could not talk like that and interact during the class because you were facing the, the board. So um, we can see here clearly that she is reflecting on, on what is happening in the classroom, but it's also like thinking about her experiences and, and seeing the advantages of the way in how the classroom is arranged differently. And uh, the recognizing that now the students have the ability of the comment their problems or to ask for help to their, to their peers or uh, work in a problem together. The other, um, the other, uh, main team that we heard in that debriefing was how the, the parents appreciated the teacher's patience and accessibility. Um, Elena said, I like that the teacher takes the time to explain the math to every child. And then Alondra commented that the teacher attitude is very important. It's important that the teacher is open to students' questions. And if one of them is still not sure about the math that the teacher explains it again. So they, uh, this, these mothers, after ending the visits, they were telling me, why didn't we stay until the, the class ended? I wanted to keep here in the class. I really liked the way the teacher was, was uh, explaining everything and then how accessible she was like for students to ask questions to her. Um, they, um, they had experiences in the classroom when they are students that were the, stu the teacher will be the one talking and they were only be listening and taking notes and seeing this new approach of the teacher of taking actually care, caring about uh, if the, each of the student understood and actually taking the time to answer questions was a really, really, really interesting experiences for them. We also have the other component, the workshop for parents. And one goal is to engage parents with the content and then approach that the children might be experiencing in the school. Another goal is to learn from the parents, their approaches, their experiences. Uh, the workshops are fairly informal and family-like. So these workshops are most of the time fully in Spanish and uh, the, the, the mothers are sitting in groups. Some of the sessions focus on critical discussion on mathematics teaching and learning and other sessions engage the participants in problem solving. The example that we have here is um, it's one of those uh, problem solving uh, activities. And uh, the activity was uh, interpret 
about interpretation of graphs. And this is the graph that we give to the mothers. Uh, the graph it is very fairly simple. And we ask them to write a history that will match that graph. We'll tell them that they could use the same labels for the axes that they have right are there interspladed, like their distance from home or time. Uh, but they end up coming with a completely um, variety of different uh, names for the axis and different uh, histories depending on their experiences. Um, since this was the first time that they uh, were trying to make a history from a graph, um, they decided at the beginning that they would work together first to make sense of the problem and try to construct a history together. And then they will like go their own ways and work by themselves. So when they were working in collaboratively, uh, one of the, the, the topics that they decided to write a story about the graph was cooking rice. And um, here's Magali kind of like start explaining what she was thinking of how the cooking rice will match the graph. She said, well, I was thinking that at room temperature one, so in the graph where uh, the origin at one, he, then you he will start heating in, and get warmer. So that will be the segment number two. And then here it is already boiling at number three. Here you have to lower the flame to the lowest level. And that's kind of four because you are lowering the flame. And because if you don't, if you don't, it will get burned. So they were, she was kind of like uh, explaining this idea of uh, how the, the rice gets cooked. And she has some ideas about temperature, lowering the temperature, the, the rice boiling, and um, some um, context about what happens if you don't turn off the, the, the flame. There were some, um, there, were, there was a conversation, a tense conversation about this. Uh, first, they couldn't come in agreement about what was the name of the axis. So what would be the, the axis names in, in this graph? Um, first, they were talking about uh, stages only, or also we'll, we'll talk about temperature, like time and temperature. Uh, they end up deciding on um, time and um, amount of water that had been evap evaporated. This led to a discussion about, we know that we know that for making rice, you need one cup of rice and two cups of water. Um, so if you get two cups of water, how much water is uh, it's evaporating? And some of them were not very, very uh, comfortable saying that they, a lot of water will, will uh, evaporate at the beginning since the first uh, segment is quite steep. And they were questioning that. Uh, also, they were uh, trying to figure out what the last segment in the graph will meet uh, because it was going down. And in the context of cooking rice, how could that be represented or what did that mean? Um, during the conversation about um, cooking rice, the mothers will talk about um, different experiences that they have cooking rice, how their mothers cook rice, different types of cooking rice, how they will prepare the rice, um, how they will uh, share it with their families, um, sharing receipts and things that those conversations seem a little bit off topic, but it still were, those conversations were helping them to make sense of the mathematics and how the graph was related to cooking rice. This is a scenario that the, they chose um, of cooking rice was something that all of them had experience with and all of them had something to share. Some, some information that they could share, something, something that they could contribute to the conversation. Right now we're uh, analyzing this, this uh, call interaction using a different focus, which is called sophisticated collaborations, um, which is a um, theoretical framework that Barbara Grodoff and two of her colleagues are uh, developed in 2018. What we have learned, uh, parents experience as school children are likely to color how they see things with their children in a school now. For example, they might value memorization and direct approach to teaching because it's what they experience. And since in many cases they see their children struggling with basic skills, they figure that part of the problem is the approach. 
engaging them and learn and learn as learnings might help change this perspective. So the parents uh, working in this mathematics workshops change their idea about mathematics um, and also change the idea about um, how their, their children are learning mathematics at school. Some components from uh, parents who participated in Math for Parents. Um, this, the first one is I went through my whole life being told how, how things were in math. And now I'm not given any freedom to figure it out my, on my own. I get excited because now I know I'm not accepting it. Accepting it. Now I know what that is the way it is. So it's this idea of them not just learning mathematics by memorization, but now they they feel that they understand actually the concepts and they feel comfortable using it and explaining it to, to their children. Another another other mother said the relationship with my daughter is closer since she now trusts information and providing her to solve her four great math problems. These programs have changed the way I see my responsibility and involvement towards my daughter's education. We need the teachers help to identify the individual needs of our kids in class so we can help them out. But at the end, as a parent, we are accountable for their success. So <clears throat> as a result of the parents participating in this mathematics workshop, their relationship with their children changed. Now their children were seeing them as someone that knew mathematics and they someone that they could go to and ask questions if they need it. And also the parents could see like that this is a um, this is a, a, a work that parents and teachers need to do together and that they, they need to go to, to get together so that they can help uh, their children uh, succeed in the mathematics classroom. All right. I'll offer some implications now next and um, and some advice from, and then Fanny will take the, the work that we've done, the conversation that we've done with the mothers um, during COVID. So the general implications of this work is we have to recognize parents as intellectual resources who play a key role in their children's education. So we've provided you know, some examples, hopefully. This is particularly important when parents come from marginalized communities whose knowledge and experiences may have been disregarded by schools. And as we've been saying all along, we need for the, we argue for the need for an authentic two-way dialogue between home and school that examines the different valorizations of knowledge. As I say, we all bring different values and, the, and challenges the power structures that consistently affect some communities. Parents want to be heard and share their experiences and knowledge of mathematics. I mean, those workshops that Fanny was referring to, particularly the one that she was referring to, the one with the graphs. I mean, the, the mothers stayed there like way past the two hours of the workshop and they were very engaged and they really wanted to continue discussing their ideas. They enjoy learning mathematics uh, and bring this learning to their family because now they see a different way as the quotes in um, showed. And in the end, it's about the children. So here's some advice from the mothers to teachers, and then we'll switch to, do not, under, so this is a group of mothers that it's, it's a combination, but we basically, we've taken mothers to speak um, um, at conferences, but also to talk to classes, methods classes in, uh, pre, or um, pre, with pre-service teachers. And so these are some of the things that we picked up that they were, in the advice that they were given. Do not underestimate the abilities of children who don't, do not speak English. Do not make assumptions about family situations. Learn from the families. And this will relate to the importance of funds of knowledge and getting to know the families. We would want teachers to know the students as individuals and not to label them and put them together in categories. And now for the last part of the, the last few slides, we're going to talk about the group, the advice COVID-19 related that Fanny and, and I did. So a few weeks ago, we, we got the opportunity to talk to three of the mothers um, of the six that we have been working for the past four years. And we asked them about uh, how was COVID and this whole pandemic uh, situation um, affecting the education of their children and what did they thought about. And uh, they, they shared several things. The first thing that they shared was that um, 
they felt that the, their role, it was not clear. What was their role as, as parents in if the children, uh, the child was there at home taking classes? Like, would they be, need to be present the whole time? Did they have to be present like short amount of times? Or when was that presence of them needed? Also, um, they, they were talking about like, what happens to those parents that, that need to go out to work, that they cannot stay at home? What happens to those parents and then the children um, that are staying at home that they don't, don't, they don't have a parent that they will help them if the connection drops, if there is some issue with the internet, if there is, um, they don't understand what activity they need to do, what happens to all those children? Also, they were talking about um, what happens when the students are a little bit older, like in middle school, high school, like do, should they like rely more in the maturity of the students for them to follow the classroom at home and being like the legion on the classes or should they be more present on that and kind of push which have a more uh, a strong position with them when they're taking classes. Also, they were talking about uh, that yes, they appreciated, appreciated the communication that they, the schools were giving them, but then at some point it was excessive. Like they would get tens, uh, dozens of email at, uh, a week and it was hard for them to follow what was happening, what was important, what they needed to focus, what was coming next, what they wanted to stay, what they should expect from the schools and things like that. So it was kind of like they were feeling overwhelmed about this. Here's a, a quote from uh, one of the mothers, Elena. I have noticed that if I am there, my son, a second grader, keeps telling me, I love you, mommy. Oh, mom, can you help me with this? I tell him, when you're at school, I don't help you. But I think that I am making him feel bad because I'm, I can see him feeling sad. He feels that nothing is going to go wrong because his mom is there. I tell him, no, you have to learn and work on your own because when it is time to go back to school, mom is not going to be there. So uh, moms are, the, the mothers are getting uh, anxious about what happens when they go back to school and what happens if the, their children already got used to it, to them to be, there the whole time, help them with class, help them with homework, like being, being there constantly, what will happen with them going to school and not having that support anymore the whole time. And them feeling anxious about like separation from them and, um, and then feeling bad that they, their parents are not dead with them. Another point that they mentioned, and it's, uh, it's related to how, um, how this, their children are being evaluated. Uh, it was about class participation. They were um, sharing that in the in the Google Meet, so in the in the classroom, there were always the same children participating. Like there were all the teacher will always ask the same children to participate. And then when they met with the teacher, the teacher will say that their child didn't participate in class. And they were uh, worried about that. And Magali uh, shared her opinion saying the school district the schools and the government can they change the way the grading also because since the teaching modality changed the way of grading should also be different it should evolve similarly my son teacher tells me that emilio's grades are lower because he does not participate in class but grading should be more lenient so magali was worried about that emilio not being he he doesn't like to participate either in class and now that, uh, that they, they're doing uh, a school um, through internet, that lack of participation was more evident. And then the teacher not calling on him made it worse. And now that lack of participation was affecting his grades, which wasn't something that was happening in the classroom. They're also were talking about um, because of the, the, the Latino culture that they felt that having the camera off was kind of like some kind of disrespect towards the teacher. And here now, like for example, in the university, we have uh, policies that you, you cannot ask the student to turn on their camera, but for the mothers, they felt that if the camera was off, 
if there was no respect uh, shown to the teacher from 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 the student. Uh, Elena said, I think that having the camera turned off showed a lack of respect for the teacher because the teacher does not know if the student is laughing at her. Or if you went away and left the computer there. I'll tell my son, for you to show your respect to the teacher and for her to start getting to know you and trust you, you need to turn on your camera and participate in class. So for them, the teacher seeing them in the camera, the teacher um, having the mental images of the students and and the students being present there was very important and was part of the education uh, and showing respect for the teacher. Also, they were talking about the lack of private moments. Sometimes they, it will happen that the mother will be screaming to the child in, in, in one of the cameras and the whole class will be hearing the same thing. Um, or sometimes a, a teacher, the, the students will be reading and the teacher will be calling up on one of the students and then they'll the rest of the students will get distracted. Um, the, door bar the dog barking in one of the cameras and the child screaming on the other one and the mom screaming on the other one, like all that um, uh, in those interactions that don't happen in the classroom, they were kind of interfering in the education of their children. And that's it. We and that's it. We are we are done so that hopefully we have time for questions because quite often in these sessions we talk and talk and talk and then there is no time for discussion. So hopefully it's time we time it better. Well, thank you so much for this for the talk. It's very informative. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to share them in the chat box, and we will get to as many of them as possible. And I don't know if you heard it, but everybody was applauding. Dr. <laughs> Simple, I know it's, it's funny this this environment that we are in. <laughs> So a first question we have here is from uh, Morgan Polakoff, and he's asking, uh, what kinds of policies or strategies do you think we should be pursuing to see teachers implementing these kinds of positive relationships with parents at a bigger scale? Is it about pre-service training PD? Uh, what can districts kind of do? So yeah, that's um, a very, very good question and one that I struggle with because here is the irony. So. I feel like sometimes I leave this, um, I don't know, what is it? Schizophrenia or double or whatever, because a lot of the work that I do with the families and with, so a lot of the work is with parents and teachers, but I've been focusing more on the parents and I feel like I've, I've had, I, I find it much harder to connect with the teachers in this work. I connect okay with the teachers when we're talking about mathematics, but when we're talking about the families, in particular with the pre-service. So I really think that it, we should be doing much more at the pre-service, I, I agree. Um, I have colleagues that building on the funds of knowledge work that I did have developed uh, very strong pre-service um, robust programs where the pre-service teachers have to take community walks and they have to really get to know, folk, get a, a child and becomes like a focused child and, and develop, get to know the child quite a lot. So at, at one point, I mean, at one level, I think the pre-service teacher is fundamental. On the other hand, I think that with teachers is perhaps easier and it makes more sense because the teachers have the direct access to the children and the families while the pre-service teachers are not in that situation. Well, they might a little bit while they're doing their field work. Um, I don't know what kinds of policies. I mean, I know that you're more of a policy person. So if you have some ideas for policies, because I'm not very good at, at the policy picture, that, that is a, a, an angle that um, I, I think that, as I said, even the light version of the home visit seems to be quite powerful. However, it's a little bit risky because it can also go the other direction in which they essentialize. So they go, they do a home visit, they don't see much. Like Louis Moll, I remember when we were talking about funds of knowledge, you know, 
if teachers come back saying that they haven't seen much, they've missed the point. They didn't know what to look for, right? So let's say that they go, they don't see much, and then they kind of confirms already what they were thinking. Yeah, you know, I went to that family, the trailer park, whatever, these lots of family members there, a mess. I mean, they start focusing in, in things that that could be a problem. So you, you walk a very fine line there about how to do it. So I don't know. I, I don't have a great answer, to be honest. Mm -hmm. We have another question here from Montana who's asking, uh, what's the best way for them to learn and recognize um, for pre-service teachers to learn and recognize intellectual resources within children's families? So I would say that if you can set up well, not now in this pandemic, it's a bit harder, right? But, but I think that if we could have, as part of the field experiences, as part of, obviously the family math nights, the bringing, but really where, where we get the pre-service teachers to hang out with families and, and, and with the kids and basically go, if, try to find out, so where do these families go? Maybe they go, they, maybe they go to the swap meet or maybe they go to this store that is very common or this grocery store or trying to see them outside the school setting a lot. I mean, so, I mean a lot, but more. And basically engage with them in, in regular conversations. I think that quite often we get very tied up because we think that everything that we're going to ask the parents has to be about school or has to be about math or has to be, and quite often just engaging about conversation. So for example, the, the teachers in the project that uh, Fanny and I work with, we had a couple of uh, um, special education um, teachers that the project that they decided to do to get to know the children was they ask their fam the parents to take a picture uh, of their child doing their favorite activity and then explain how it had math or whatever. Okay, so some of them had more math than others, but the power, I mean, the parents were so happy to share that picture of their child and what the child was doing and be able to talk about it and that the teacher had shown an interest in that. And that seemed like a fairly simple activity and, and so they put together a book that I have actually, and it's beautiful. You just have all these different kids. And so one is, uh, I don't know, at the, at the park doing something. Another one is at Peter Piper Pizza, whatever. I mean, you know, they're doing different things are completely different, but that's what the parents chose to share. So something like this might help. I mean, um, yes, I noticed Michael that you put the, the link to the Teach Math. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have one question. What are some of the design features you take up in your projects to help overcome some of the barriers to parent engagement? Well, so one of the key things, so, so parent, parent recruitment is still an issue. Okay, so let's not, I mean, in this project that we had, um, we, the most recent one, the parents who came were usually the parents who were already somewhat engaged in the school. Trying to reach out beyond that is not easy. It hasn't been easy for us. Um, we told the mothers, because it was all women, that for the math for parents, they had to invite an, a guest. They had to bring someone. Well, the first year, yeah, we had a couple of guests here and there, but then after that, it just fizzled out and we did not insist, you know. And when we asked, they said, yeah, well, they're busy or they don't want to come and do math. and. You know, so what worked the best for us was in another project, a former participant, uh, one of the mothers had started her own workshops for the middle school. And she worked at the school and she was a magnet for the recent immigrant parents. She spoke Spanish herself and she basically, and she was very assertive. Actually, she's the mother, full disclosure, she's the mother whose quote I share about the division and so, I don't know if you could appreciate it. You see the video, it's much stronger, but she was, she's a very strong personality. And so this mother was able to bring in lots of fathers and mothers, uh, mostly recent immigrants to do, the, to do workshops. And so you basically need someone from the community that believes in what you're doing and then works and you work with them. I find it very hard to do it if I just go by myself. And going through the principal, even though 
that's what we usually do is not the best because the principal is going to quite often select, I mean, you know, the ones that are already there. And so really, if you can find someone, ideally, if you could almost do the workshops, not in the school, like in a community center. So one of the most successful besides the one that I just described with the mother was at a public library, at a public library, but it was with mothers that we had already worked with. And then they wanted to continue and we started doing it at the public library. And so building on that, Fanny and I wanted to do something similar now. And in March, we had our first meeting at the public library. And then guess what? That was it because the pandemic came. So I really think that if you can find the community centers, some people have worked with churches. I remember, I mean, I had some friends who did a very interesting work with black parents in Philadelphia at a church, you know, um, where there is someone from the community right there who believes in what they're doing. That's the main design principle because um, bringing the parents is not easy. We have another question here. Have you been able to see if there's any uh, positive correlations between the impl implementation of these funds of knowledge practices and students' mathematical achievement on a large scale? Is there any, any empirical work around that? The only work that, that I've seen or that, that I was involved in was several years ago um, with the funds of knowledge, the original project, uh, funds of knowledge, um, with the second grade, I mean, with, we didn't know the grades, but I mean, I work very closely with the second grade uh, teacher at a school that serves mostly um, Yaki, uh, Native American um, students and also Latinx or Mexican American. And, um, and we did a little bit of the pre and post, um, not so much in math, but actually in writing, because it was, it was an integrated unit on construction, on the, on the knowledge that the kids had about construction. And they had a lot of knowledge about construction. So the model was all around construction. There is a chapter in the Funds of Knowledge work where that is explained and I can uh, put the reference in, but um, actually the reference is, let me put the reference before I forget and then I, actually you can put the reference in the funny in the, because it's in the reference list, okay. It's for the book. So, so anyway, so in that particular, um, um, ex you know, experience, the pre and post was amazing in how the kids express themselves. So the knowledge about construction, they had it. They had it pre and they had it post. But in the writing and how they organize their thinking, and you could almost analyze it from the point of view of, of mathematics also, because it was a very logically organized thinking in the post test. So you know, we've done a little bit of that, but at large scale, not really. We've, I'm not that I'm aware of. I haven't done it and I, I'm not aware uh, people have done it, yeah, so. Can you talk about any differences you all have seen um, in your work with elementary versus middle school teachers and families? Mm, you know, not that many, actually. I don't, I don't know that I've noticed that many, that many differences because some of the middle school teachers who were involved, uh, to be honest. I mean, they were teaching math, but that was not necessarily their forte either. <laughs> so um, the main, I mean, there is one particular um, teacher who is now actually a colleague of ours at the university who was a middle school teacher when he did the funds of knowledge. And he also had a background in civil engineering and in architecture. And so he was able to draw a lot of the mathematics and, and do amazing projects. And there's always been this questioning also about how much mathematics do you need to know to really build on the funds of knowledge and develop rich mathematical concepts? Because some of us, the mathematics that we know is very academic and we might not see the mathematics in a seamstress or in a mechanic or in a carpenter. And this person, you know, Jose David could do it. I mean, he could do it. So it's always been a, a little bit of a tension there as to how much, you know, and then how much can teachers do if I'm questioning that? And yes, I am familiar, very familiar with the algebra project and the young people's project. In fact, um, I participate in some of the weekly uh, discussions with uh, Bob Moses and, and his team. Um, there are certainly some 
common point points in common, particularly you know with the origin of the algebra project. I mean, not the or the origin is the civil rights, but but the idea of using the metro, the subway system in Boston to teach about negative numbers and you know and I mean about integers and some connections there. Yeah. I have a question for Fanny. Um, where do you see kind of your work kind of heading as you're kind of learning about this space and kind of what do you hope to kind of change or kind of see and take up? Um, since I have been working in, for the past years with with families, I'm quite interested in, in how parents um, help their children achieve or like, um, go through this process of education and help them. Um, I have noticed that parents, um, Latinx parents, they want their children to have a better future, right? Not necessarily have more money, but have a, a very conditions of life, very conditions of work. And so I, right now that we are like working with positioning, I started to looking into positioning uh, on the other project, I would like to try to see how parents position their children and how parents also position teachers and how that place takes a, takes a play in, in how they uh, see the education of their children and their involvement in the education of their children. And finally to Marta, where do you kind of see the field kind of going with funds of knowledge kind of from here? Um, mostly, um, hmm, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's the good answer, but, um, I think that many people are doing funds of knowledge work has become like, you know, you, you hear it a lot. And I sometimes wonder if the, those who develop funds of knowledge would recognize what people are doing as funds of knowledge, including what I do, by the way. I mean, I'm, you know, so I'm talking more about Luis Moore, Norma Gonzalez, you know, the, the people who, um, but. I actually think that ideally, if we could transform the teaching of mathematics, I, I still think that we, we have too much of a separation between the mathematics that we think that people need to learn. And I'm not really sure that we really know that that's what they need to learn, but you know, and what the funds of knowledge can provide. And so I still think that there is a gap because there are certain aspects of mathematics in middle school and high school that might be harder to get through the forms of knowledge. Now, having said that, this colleague of mine who's doing work at the undergrad, for example, has been exploring uh, in linear algebra. Um, he has a paper about how the, a group of women, uh, students of color at the undergrad level, use their everyday experiences to understand the concept of basis in linear algebra. So, you know, in the project that I was mentioning in the previous session we were talking, we might be looking at, at, at things like this. However, I still think that on one hand, we have the mathematics, the body of mathematics that we think people have to learn that sometimes we don't question and the, and the more cultural component that the funds of knowledge brings. And for me, it's more what I what I hope that we'll see is at least an appreciation of the fact that people have different ways of thinking about the problems in general. That people have um, more of a, I mean, well, different, yeah, different strategies, and so focus more on the ways. So a colleague of mine, my my colleague in New Zealand, and I have been talking about looking at the cultural ways of being. So for example, the work that I did with middle school students. We look at humor, we look at how they use humor, we look at how they use um, this informal conversation that, that um, Fanny was referring to when they might be doing a problem and they're talking about something that seems off task, but really is not off task because it helps them solve the problem. So I'm more interested in, in, in teachers appreciating that there is a lot of, um, there is a lot, a lot more to funds of knowledge if we take more an attitude of what is it that the communities and the uh, bring, and it's not just the knowledge that, in, it's not so much the emphasis on the funds of knowledge, on the knowledge, but more on the ways of being. 
the ways of interacting, the ways of talking, the, um, the use of, as I said, I remember a problem that we're talking about something, they were doing a problem in class and one of the kids says, hey, are you going to a party? To, are you going to have a party for your birthday in the middle of class? And then, yeah, I think I will. Yeah, I'm going to have, are you going to have ceviche? Yeah, maybe I'll have ceviche. And there is this whole conversation and, and teachers might just kind of put it aside, but it's part of, they were working on the problems. They were doing some geometric construction. They were doing it, but they were chatting. So that to me is more important from a teaching point of view. Uh, okay, Richard has a very interesting question that I would need to think more about it because unless Richard, you want to tell us more about it. I'm concerned about intersecting the networks, not features. Looks like Richard. Would I, I, uh, Marta, I think what I was trying to get at is that it seems that part of the whole idea behind funds of knowledge and working with the community has to do with the fact that it's, it's not up to mathematicians to decide what mathematics should be taught. The, it's like the mathematics that should be taught is the mathematics that the community decides it needs in order to live a, a, a life with meaning. Mm -hmm. And part of that is not just the, uh, say, intellectual slash educational aspects of it. But uh, what does it mean, just like a uh, hundred years ago, people could get jobs in factories without knowing how to read. Mm -hmm. uh, reading is commonly accepted today as sort of a basic component of just being a citizen in this, being a member of this, our society, of a democratic society. Similarly, one can make the argument that mathematics is sort of like the new minimum requirement for participating in a 21st century economy. So the question is, um, so should we, pay, should we be paying more attention to uh, sort of privileging the kind of math content that leads to the ability of people to interact well within society, as opposed to, you know, getting people ready to take calculus? I mean, my answer would be, would be yes. And it goes back to then Michael's question about the, where the funds of knowledge work is going, because I think that we will need to rethink the whole mathematics sequence, but I don't know. I don't want to be put in a position. It's always tricky, right? Because the math that the community, that, it, that is going to serve the community, if the community in power doesn't change, are we then diminishing the opportunities of these other communities to reach you know the, the what is what is uh, what is sanctioned by the who is in power so sometimes I get really nervous that I don't want to be experimenting <laughs> with with the groups that that we're working with but on the other hand I, I mean I totally agree with, with you and so it's almost like the change has to come I don't know from 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 where you know um, but I was thinking, I mean, like right now, we're still arguing as to whether students should be taking algebra and then the pre-calculus, the calculus, when really I think that people are starting to agree that more of a data and understanding of, of numeracy and data in general makes more sense than, mm -hmm. than knowing how to operate, you know, and, and how to find whatever derivatives. And, but I don't know that we're going to see that, that changing. I mean, yes, the universities are starting, but it's still being portrayed as well. If you want to go into engineering and all that, you need that, which I'm not denying that you do, but, but then it becomes more like a second class citizen, perhaps, if you're going to be doing this other kind of math. And so I don't want the same thing to happen with the communities, which is why the algebra project is so powerful, right? Because Bob Moses, I mean, he was, he's very clear. This is about teaching algebra and, and more, but I mean, this is not about uh, teaching fluffy, whatever, or doing, it's about making sure that these kids are ready for algebra so I can then take, he's a mathematician, right? You yes. know, I, I, yes. So, yes, yes. So I feel this tension. I feel this tension because I'm with you, but then how do you do it without actually doing, harming their opportunities? Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps, perhaps we can have a conversation about it sometime. I would love to, I would love to. 
Well, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you especially to Dr. Seville and to uh, Fanny Salazar for joining us today. Um, I would like to say one thing here. Uh, we do have one more talk or we have two more talks this semester. The next one will occur on November 18th, uh, 2020. Um, at three o'clock with Dr. Tani Bartel from Michigan State University. And we look forward to hearing from her, but thank you so much, Dr. Seville and uh, Ms. Salazar. We really appreciate your time today. So, so you can ask Tanya everything about teach math. She can tell you about <laughs> Very much so. I think, I think that might be up her alley. Yep. <laughs> Talk about applying uh, two consecutive talks together. That's it, that's it. All right, well, thank you so much. I mean, it's a pleasure to have done this and have a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs>